Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Bethel Dukes branch of Asala for our, I want to say, fifth presentation that we're doing related to voting and voting suppression. And we've had a, a number of dynamic speakers over the last several months. And we want to continue that conversation today with our speakers. Uh, our committee to help host these meetings is, is made up of uh, our president, uh, Ida E. Jones, uh, Dr. Janet Sims Woods, Woods uh, and Demita Green. Uh, who is our webmaster and keeps our sessions going. And I wanna say thank you to everyone to, who has participated to this at this point in time. Our next speaker that's going to be next month will be Marvin Jones. And he's going to be talking about the Winston Triangle families of USCTS. Uh, U.S. colored troops, and um, that should be a very interesting discussion in another direction. Uh, we are coming upon the election, uh, which will be taking place in November. Uh, a number of people have already gotten out to vote. I work at the Woodridge Library for D.C. Public Libraries, and uh, which is located at 18th and Ro Rhode Island Avenue North northeast and there's a senior group that is in the community a very active senior group the model city senior wellness center uh, located on ebart street between um, eight, uh, 20th and 18th street northeast and they've been having a number of virtual meetings and one of the things that they wanted to do this month is um, show their support for voting and so on thursday of last week a group of the of the women, uh, it was all women this time, but uh, came out and there's a voting box in front of the Woodridge Library and they posed for some pictures of them putting their ballots into the box because they wanted to make sure that other people, you know, if they can do it, um, we can, you know, we should all should participate in this. And uh, one of the women that came out to the meeting uh, is 100 years old. Her name is uh, Ms. McKinley. And uh, on November the 6th, she'll be 101. And she was actively out there and she was very adamant about uh, making sure that everyone get involved. That's good. So um, with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Jones. Um, who is also our guest speaker for today, but uh, she's president of the Bethel Dukes branch and she'll give some welcome from the branch. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Eric, our program chair, committee chair. I wanna welcome everyone to our program, virtual Bethel Dukes programming. And we're in line with the national theme of ASALH, which is African-Americans and the vote. So we will have a conversation on the idea of the electorate for African Americans coming from Baltimore this time with my presentation. But I also want to invite you to consider joining the association. They have for over 105 years been documenting and chronicling the history of the life and history and culture of African people in the tradition of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who sought to refute the negative images of Birth of a Nation, that vile film that was celebrated by President Woodrow Wilson. Woodson decided to call together other academics to be able to write and chronicle the history of our people and then to share that information through academic, instructional, cultural, and other ways in which we can celebrate and document ourselves. So that's what we seek to do with the Bethel Dukes branch. We are open and available for conversation. And as we prepare with uh, Marvin Jones's presentation on next month for our 2021 theme, which is African-American family, the African-American family. So him talking about USCT genealogy is gonna be very relevant because we'll be talking all about the family in terms of what does that look like, the nuclear family, the extended family and fictive kin. So join us and keep uh, the association in mind and also log on and subscribe to ASALH TV on YouTube. You can kind of see some past programming and some future programming where we throughout the country are seeking to cultivate our history and 
culture for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and take it away, Dr. Woods. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker for today, which is our branch president, which we're very proud of. This is Dr. Ida E. Jones. She is the first university archivist hired at Morgan State University. She is the author of four books. Her recent book, Baltimore City Rights Leader Victorine Q. Adams, The Power of the Ballot, won the 2019 AAHGS International Biography Book Award. This book chronicles the life and legacy of Baltimore's first African-American city councilwoman, Victorine Q. Adams. In spring 2020, her blog post, Mary McLeod Bethune, True Democracy and the Right for Universal Suffrage, appeared on the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission website. Her dedication to archival, archive, excuse me, garnered her the Emory University's inaugural Carter G. Woodson Research Fellowship. In 2020, she was awarded two grants, an IMLS Museum Grant for African American History and Culture, and the Library of American Lift Every Voice, Why African American Poetry Matters. She is involved in a variety of professional organizations. In 2019, she was appointed to the Board of National Collaboration for Women's History Sites. And also she received the 2019 Mary McCobb Service Award from Asala. Dr. Jones is currently co-vice president of the Baltimore City Historical Society and managing editor of the Gaslight BCHS's newsletter. She has appeared on programs such as C-SPAN, National Public Radio, BBC Radio, and a numerous uh, printed publications. A native of Cambridge, Massachusetts, she is a graduate from Howard University. Dr. Jones is a consummate scholar who believes deeply in the words of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, who stated, quote, power must walk hand in hand with humanity and the intellect must have a soul, end quote. Good afternoon, President Ida Jones. Thank you so very much for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Sims Wood, President Emerita of the Bethel Dukes <laughs> branch and one whose shadow I stand in, in terms of HBCU love for history and culture. So thank you so very much on that lovely introduction. I would like to share my screen with you and get this conversation started about Victorine Quill Adams. She is quite a notable figure in Baltimore City <clears throat> for a number of reasons, which we will eventually start talking about. And uh, as I go, here we go, excellent. Okay, so on this afternoon, I wanna to talk to you about Victorine Q. Adams teaching, voting and holding office. This is an, all the images in this presentation are from her collection. I must just preface by saying that she was very intentional and very clear in understanding the importance of the archival record and making sure that her legacy and her footprint would exist post her life. So her collection is one of the most comprehensive collections on black women's political life at the local level that I have seen held by an HBCU special collections or archive. So this is a picture of her in the 1970s, I think it's 1975. She's resplendent in the hat about democratic women. And this is from a woman's fair in which she's advocating for various issues that pertain to her community. And you can see here that it's interracial with this other woman that she's working with. So Victorine Quill Adams was born on April 28, 1912 to Joseph Quill and Estelle Tate Quill at Johns Hopkins University. She graduated from the Frederick Douglass High School in 1928, Coppin Normal School, which is now Coppin State University in 1930, and Morgan State College, which is now Morgan State University in 1940. After a decade of teaching in 1946, Adams founded the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee, which encouraged black women to register to vote and recruited them to run for public office. As I mentioned, all these images are from her collection. So you see this lovely portrait of hers uh, in the center with the oval frame. Then you see a picture of her and her brother, a clearly staged photograph. She's about five or six years old in that photograph. I do love it. And then you see at the very bottom of the screen is her with her fellow teachers and students at the segregated school systems in Baltimore. And all the schools she attended 
were during that era Jim Crow and therefore all black schools. Of note is that Coppin State or Coppin Normal School was created by the state of Maryland to preclude African-American women from attending the College Park flagship school to receive teaching certification. Here she is again teaching at the Robert Brown Elliott School in the 1930s. Baltimore City schools were racially segregated often underfunded and overcrowded. The early civil rights activists were comprised of public school teachers seeking better accommodations for their students. So you can see she was a very petite woman. She is teaching elementary school and her charge is nearly three quarters of her height. She was not a very uh, large woman. She maintained a rather petite stature throughout the course of her life. And clearly this picture is very profound because it's so interesting. We were able to see the students, they're clearly eating in the classroom where they're having their meals. You can see how they're dressed. You can see the complexion, demographics. It really becomes a document looking at this picture from the 1930s during the depression era as she's teaching. She was also a club woman and she belonged to an, a variety of clubs. <clears throat> So this picture here is from the Iota Phi Lambda Businesswoman Sorority, where she's pictured in 1958 in the center with legs crossed next to the lady with the large white lapels. And she was woman of the year for her activity in the business world. So she belonged to a variety of clubs that represented all aspects of her life. These organizations allowed women to harness their intellectual and financial power to remedy the ills and fill voids in their community. She held membership in Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, the National Council of Negro Women, the National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women, and Iota Phi Lambda Sorority, as well as Delta Chi Sigma, another teaching sorority. So she held membership in a number of organizations that were represented her entire life. Once again, this picture is very demonstrate, demonstra excuse me, demonstrative a little tired, demonstrative of the way in which African-American women dealt with respectability. You can see how well-dressed they are with their furs and their hats. So they really claimed a sense of purpose in regards to being those epistles read of men and how they chose to carry themselves as professional women. So when we get to her organization, this Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee was formed in 1946. And their motto was, if democracy is worth fighting for, it's worth voting for. Its members sought to welcome all women, register all, enlighten all, interest more women in politics, stimulate and educate the public on the value of the ballot, register more voters, get them out at election time, and to take part in the civic political and social progress of the city. Here she is against the wall, the once again, the petite woman against the wall. And this is a man named Philip Grossman who was running for political office where she would have members of her committee interrogate or question the candidate on their platform with regard to the agenda that they were seeking to do at that particular time. Here she is again, like I said, all these pictures are from her collection. And I do have captions of the pictures in my book. I don't have them in this particular PowerPoint presentation. But once again, you see the way in which they're dressed and they are in Washington DC talking to congressmen from Maryland. So recording and reporting information, and this is in the notes to her group, do not be overdressed, be neat, wear a hat and gloves, no slips showing, please, no loud talking. Be alert at all times, speak clearly if called upon, give your name and your title, make sure to mention Miss or Mrs. Registered Voter and interested in good government. Take a friend with you, the more the merrier. However, only the delegate or the alternate will be paid. If you cannot go at the appointed time, let us know better or better still get a substitute, a lady in the club. So I find it to be very interesting that she was very clear on the idea of representational politics and being able to have a strategy to engage the political sphere. Let me see here. Okay. All righty. So the CWDCC didn't work in silo. It worked in concert with other organizations throughout the city of Baltimore and eventually would morph into another organization later on in the 1950s. 
So they affiliated with the Red Cross, the NAACP Community Fund, the Urban League, the League of Women's Clubs, the Association to Abolish the Poll Tax, Women's Leagues for Peace and Freedom, Send a Girl to Camp. <clears throat> its regular activities included meeting on the first Tuesday of each month. Here she is pictured in the center next to the woman in the black dress with the kind of white corsage. To her right, her left, excuse me, the man here that I have my arrow on is Willard Allen. He was the most worshipful Grand Master of the Prince Hall Lodge Masons of Maryland and an insurance salesman as well as a trustee at Morgan College. So she is literally rubbing elbows with individuals who have great power in terms of galvanizing membership to move on behalf of the black ballot. The woman that is standing in profile, um, the second from the right on the first row, <clears throat> I have my cursor over her, that's Lily May Jackson. She was very a stalwart in the NAACP and her daughter Juanita Jackson Mitchell would be a lawyer who would do work with the Scottsboro Boys and those are rather stalwart names in Baltimore. So this is who Victorine Adams is rubbing shoulders with literally in terms of the effort to equalize and equitize the position of African Americans in Baltimore City and ultimately the state of Maryland. The first victory I have to share with you is Senator Harry Cole. So the CWDCC wasn't just about the theory of voting or just getting people to vote. They were gonna use their political power to galvanize for the candidates they felt would address their concern. And their first success was the election of Senator Harry Cole. Senator Harry Cole attended the segregated public schools and obtained a undergraduate degree from Morgan in 1943. He served in the army in World War II he obtained a law degree from the University of Maryland in 1949, and he was the first black lawyer hired as an assistant state attorney to provide legal advice in the state of Maryland. Now the political scene in Baltimore City, as along with other kind of old cities, or just the political process in general, was rather contested. So according to my colleague, Matt Crenson, he says that in the 1920s, Baltimore Democratic, the Baltimore Democratic Party, let me go back here, I'm trying to, getting a little click, click envy here. Let's see if I do that. Stated that the Democratic Party had limited leverage with black voters. Patronage and favors attracted a minority of black Baltimoreans to the Democratic Party. Principally, they were African Americans. They were Republican. In Baltimore, segregation and overt racism threatened the expanding Democratic Party. Similar, similar to the nation, the white-black balance needed to be maintained unless Southern whites were antagonized and left the Democratic Party. The tenuous threads pro benefited Jack Pollack, whose political territory included judges and the city and state lawmakers. Toward this end, the black-white alliances could form because race was a bargaining chip where some black votes enriched white politicians. When Cole announced his bid for state Senate, this disturbed Pollack's plans and he selected a candidate already. So he had not anticipated anyone coming against his chosen candidate. In 1954, Cole defeated a Pollack candidate. Cole's success initiated the unraveling of Pollack's vice-like grip on the African-American majority of the west side of Baltimore. Cole's victory was not without contention. Very important to understand that in Baltimore, there are two sides. There are four quadrants, almost like DC, but the west side was where the, principally the elite and fair complected African-Americans lived. And the east side was considered less moneyed than the West. So there is some issue in regards to Baltimore in terms of whether you're from the East side or the West side. Nevertheless, Melnikov, who was the candidate chosen by Pollack to run, challenges Cole over the election results. The November election results were being rechecked by December because of a slim margin of 37 vote difference and one voter signature. So Bernard Melnikov lost to Cole and sought to have the ballots checked he was needling about it because he failed to realize how he could have lost. The Afro-American newspaper reported that Cole spent over $2,000 on his campaign, while Melnikov spent less than 1000 
On September, October the 16th, a dinner was hosted to benefit the coalition ticket, which was Theodore McKeldin for governor, as well as Cole. The contributions to Cole's campaign from that dinner was $1,300. The recheck found no fraud in the election, and Cole was sworn in as the first African-American state senator in Maryland. His victory proved that an informed and organized voting community could affect change. And you see that 37 vote difference is so slim. And then that one voter could contest with regards to a signature. Cole introduced a piece of legislation in the freshman year of his administration in March of 1955, Senate Bill number 20, excuse me, 219, 219. The Civil Rights Bill sought to provide equal rights for all persons in certain places of public accommodation resort for and resorts or amusement. The bill sought to ensure that all persons within Maryland would be entitled to full and equal accommodations, advantages, and facilities. Violators, the business, the violator would be fined $100 to $500 under the proposed law. In April of 1955, the penalty clause killed the bill. The white Republicans abandoned coal and aligned themselves with the Democrats, believing, quote unquote, progress takes time and therefore penalizing businesses or people for attempting to change is unfair. So coal only served one term in the state Senate as a result of that effort to really do punitive damages to businesses that were against the idea of the rising civil rights tie throughout the 1950s that will eventually swell in the 1960s. The CWDCC was a calling to Victory Adams. Standing here is Charles Tilden, another Morgan graduate and Politico. And then of course, these are members of her Congress, Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee in her home. Victorine viewed the work of the CWDCC as more than an agent of political education, but a calling to serve the race and social justice. There was an induction ceremony similar to collegiate sororities. I must also note that Victorine was an ardent Catholic and that the African-American Catholic community starts in Baltimore with the Sisters of the Oblates of Providence. So they are over 200 and something year old nunnery <clears throat> that really proliferates African Catholicism throughout America. So it really starts in Baltimore, not Louisiana, as we tend to think. The CWDCC membership initiation is in the papers. So as a result, she says that um, the collection details the membership initiation ceremony. There's candle lighting. There is an incorporated biblical scripture. There are elements of your character. The ritual also afforded participants an opportunity to understand the aims of what the organization was seeking to do. And it also included uh, several candle bearers charging members with their responsibility. And one example, it says the leader stated, this then is our time to build up our organization and thereby help build up democracy in our time. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. May he in his almighty wisdom help us build wisely and with strength and conviction, the CWDCC is like a house that needs to be built on a larger scale. So we, the members of that body have seen fit to welcome an addition to our house. Uh, the women of the 16th Ward. Furthermore, it goes on with the description of the induction ceremony. Verda Welcome was a member of this organization. She's also going to serve as the first African American woman in the country to be elected to the state Senate or any state Senate. She too is a Morgan graduate as well as a Coppin Normal School graduate. And in her recitation, it says, as women of a political group, we must aim to stimulate and educate the public on the value of the ballot. All of the ills that we confront could be eliminated or greatly relieved by the skillful use of the ballot at election time. We must teach our people to vote not for men, but for issues. That's very profound. This is the 1940s, 50s. Miss Ruth White, a charter member of the CWDCC, stated, the main aim of the CWDCC is to interest more men in politics. Too long has a new life. The members of this organization pledge themselves to do everything possible to interest more of our women in politics. Now, I thought this is very interesting. When we talk about women's groups, we often think that they're in separate spaces, uh, contrary to men. 
but the CWDCC did not. They incorporated men. And this is a picture of the Minutemen. And so they actually had men who were the husbands or the family members who actually assisted them with their efforts. And this has a caption. Picture is Sid Nor, William White, Caesar Jones, James Morris, and Dallas Davis. So she actually has this picture captioned and it lets you see that men are clearly involved, once again, dressed in a certain fashion of respectability. The CWDCC impact also sought to make the political process relatable by using issues to teach about. Here they are with the Baltimore Bullets and they were celebrating the Baltimore Bullets efforts at kind of reducing efforts of Jim Crow and racism. They incorporated additional aspects of political consciousness and empowerment through subtle and direct intention. Its members sought to educate or interest more women in politics at the polls. So here you see Victorine in the black with the lovelies to the far right of the picture, sitting next to clearly one of the players of the Baltimore Bullets, along with other members of her CWDCC. <clears throat> This picture is captioned, and the captions in the book, so I guess you have to buy the book to find out, but if not, I gladly can find out for you when the, during the question and answer. So here she is as the councilwoman. So what happens is that after she creates her Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee, in 1958, she's going to join with another woman and create Woman Power Incorporated, and that's going to have regional impact because it's going to have different chapters and states along the eastern seaboard. She's going to run for state office as well. Victorine Adams runs for the state senate in Maryland. She is elected, but she steps down from that position in 1966 and then runs for city council in Baltimore City in 1967. And she realized because Verda Welcome and other African-American women were in the state level, that there was too many voices there, but no one was on the city level. So she sought to reduce herself and return to the city of Baltimore to be able to provide voice and clarity for issues on the local level. She is standing, of course, the only woman, they call it a rose among thorns. And these are a number of African-American legislators throughout Baltimore City. The one to her immediate left that my cursor is on is her husband, Willie Adams. They were married for nearly 70 years. And he was an ardent supporter and lover of hers. And he allowed her to shine without trying to make her kind of kowtow to traditional gender norms. So the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee becomes Woman Power Incorporated. She co-founded that with Ethel P. Rich, who was a social worker. And they sought to broaden the idea of the image of what a politician looks like. So moving from the idea of a male politician to a female politician, from an outsider as a non-lawyer uh, to a concerned citizen advocating for rights. She believed that different perspectives enriched the community and together an elected office was stronger than remaining on the sidelines. See here. So here she is at her campaign headquarters at Mondamin Mall, which her husband helped to purchase and create. And I love what Lerone Bennett says. And this is a quote I found from in her collection. There was a conference in Chicago, I want to say in 1967 or 1968. And Lerone Bennett says, the mission of the Black politician is to do what white politicians have failed to do, define and actualize liberty and equality as a faith and a way of life. In the final analysis, not to mend the petty conflicts of the moment, nor to close the, some tiny gaps in the discourse of the day, that is the historic mission of the black politician, advancing designs and policies for a thousand tomorrows for blacks and whites. So she was attending a conference and this was in Chicago in this paper by Lerone Bennett. This is an excerpt from a larger piece he had written and presented at that conference. And I love it to say that the black politician will now actualize what democracy looks like. And you can see from the pictures here that there are blacks and white women with her as well. And throughout the book, there are other ethnic groups as well. So she sought to equitize that sense of committee and community. Victorine's legacy. Making a difference is what she did. She taught elementary school, invested in social movements that appealed to her sense of justice during her adulthood. She founded the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee and campaigned for public office, placing herself within the halls of power to craft compassionate legislation benefiting all Baltimoreans. So I wanna thank you. And this is a lovely slip from her collection that tells you about the Victorine's team. And you can see once again, there are men and women listed here. And they're also her cousin, Alan Quill is listed here, Ethel P. Rich, uh, and then the Victorine team, Donald Schaefer, Walter Orlinsky, and others who are running along the democratic line. So this is a very lovely image from her collection.
So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and take questions and engage you, the audience. Thank you. So, all right, our audience, um, do, if you have any questions for Dr. Jones's wonderful presentation, please post them in the Q&A. At present, we don't have any questions, but we certainly welcome you to post them at any time. Uh, the Q&A is open for Dr. Ida and any questions that you may have for her. I will turn this over back to Dr. Janet Sims Woods. Thank you, Dr. Jones. That was an excellent presentation, um, especially in this time where we're talking about voter rights, voter suppression, uh, and things of that nature as we get ready to have this next election. Um, could you say a little bit about uh, what types of voter suppression did you see that, that she received as she was running for office? And, there's a, that's a very good question. The idea that Maryland did not ratify the 19th Amendment till 1941 was in fact one of the most glaring error, errors within the state. And then of course they didn't ratify that or certify that ratification till 1958. So Maryland was very clear on its efforts to kind of mute the voices of women, African-American women in particular, and as a result did not seek to really integrate them into the body politic. So that was one of the most overt efforts statewide that African-American women in, in, uh, encountered. On the, her personal level, because of the fact that her husband was a very notable individual, that she did not personally encounter any kinds of issues with regards to suppression. But there was the political machine that Baltimore had, Chicago had one, New York, Baltimore, Boston. So <clears throat> encountering the political machine of uh, Polak and other individuals who already kind of designated who they wanted to be in place did at times run afoul to her campaign. But once again, her husband, Willie Adams, who was a numbers runner, who becomes rather a very prominent businessman and um, power broker in his own right, really makes a statement with regards to how she was able to have a hedge of protection that kind of insulated her from some of the things that other persons would get with smear campaigns in regards to um, some of the personal attacks women suffer when running for politics our political office, excuse me. <clears throat> I see that Marvin Jones had a question. Um, I hate to preempt you, Jan, but um, he was asking about her political campaign. And she put money into her campaign. And in the book, there are tons of pictures of her using children to kind of be human bulletin boards for her. And her efforts were not to kind of exploit the children, but to help them understand that this is part of their lives. This is part of their process. As an educator, she was a teacher. So everything was a teachable moment, that there is nothing beyond the child's reach in terms of aspiring to something, because you want to plant seeds as young as possible so they grow into a level of consciousness. And I've met a number of Black women uh, legislators, actually even Adrian Jones right now in the state Senate, belong to Women Power Incorporated. Victorine didn't pass away until 2006. So there are current African-American women who are sitting in office right now who remember her, who said that she modeled behavior for them and she kind of encouraged them. Even Senator Mikulski, Barbara Mikulski was a city councilman in Baltimore at the time. And I actually had the pleasure of being able to talk with her and she wrote a lovely letter for her to get victory in the Women's Hall of Fame saying that, how is she not in the Women's Hall of Fame? She did so much for women uh, politicians during that time because it was right during the women's rights movement and the idea that women have a certain place and some of the mayors are a little bit derogatory. And actually, um, Mary Pat Clark, who was an outgoing city councilman said, yeah, um, Donald Schaefer would call us girls. You know, Barbara and I were girls. He would never refer to Victorine as such. You know, she was councilman Adams, where we were just, you know, girls. And so there was some, just even language was a bit offensive. So she really did run a full court press for women in general. So we had another question um, from Ms. Frederica Barrow. How can this powerful information get included in history books for children and adolescents in the Maryland educational system? She's a wonderful Baltimore role model. We are working on that. There has been a number of persons who have approached me privately as well as um, Organizationally, I'm now part of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. I belong to that board right now. So the efforts are to do passive education in terms of um, 
there's a monument being proposed. One woman actually is leading a crusade to have certain monuments put up around the city in, in regards to persons such as her. And there's also that educational effort to kind of put her on the calendar of first because people don't really even celebrate the first they talk about the mayors and the governors but they don't talk about city council persons or school board people so the idea is to expand who and what success looks like so once again we have to redefine and kind of reimagine what does success look like and incorporate those persons whose images and names fall off the radar so that's one effort that we are doing in the city of baltimore and in the state of maryland wonderful wonderful information um, I Kellogg poses the question, who were some of the prominent African-American women in DC who worked with the CWDC, especially the Eastern stars in chapters in DC perhaps? I have not seen evidence of it reaching to Washington DC. Her Greek letter organizations all are national in scope. So Sigma Gamma Rho sorority, as well as Iota Phi Delta and um, I think it's Delta Kappa Chi. Uh, they're, they're all national in scope. So I definitely know that she had influence through those organizations and with regards to uh, cross fertilizing. But I don't see any direct names in terms of uh, Sharon Pratt Kelly or someone along those lines that I could think of in terms of DC politics directly connecting with her. But she was also very much involved with the Girl Scouts and her HBCU alumni uh, organization. So I know there was definite cross fertilization with Howard University and Morgan in terms of faculty, staff and students. So it's very well that she could have had some kind of peripheral influence, but I have yet to find that uh, out as yet. A lot of this because people are still yet living, uh, some of them are very excited to see their names in the book. I've met some women who are in their 80s and 90s who are like, oh, my name is in the book, you know, because they were founding members or charter members that are very close to her and in the documents. So I let the document speak and then now I'm actually kind of adding to that the human story. So I need to kind of do some more research on that. If you have a name, I can look at that. But I don't, I don't see Eastern Stars as much. I know that she was very much involved in the Catholic Church at um, St. Peter Claver Church. So I, I need to look at the church as well. because I know St. Augustine's was started by the Oblates. So there's very well, there could be some cross fertilization with the Catholic Church. Eric White. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, please, Dr. Janet Sims Woods, please. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Ada, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, some of her local things that she was doing, like, for instance, her work with the Century Club, and uh, especially the, you know, she did some fundraising like, for Providence Hospital. What were some of the local things that she was trying to also not just to get women in politics, but also to engage the local community and help them uh, get things done there? a very good question. Because she was an educator and she actually was kind of a fashionista, she opens up a thing called the Charm Center, which is a boutique, of a hot couture boutique on Pennsylvania Avenue. And she actually went to the Barrett School during the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Children that were orphaned or children that were without any kind of means of support were kind of um, warehoused or institutionalized by the state. And the Barrett School was the Black version or the colored girls version. So she actually held classes at the Barrett School on dress and adornment and career programs preparation for these girls who did not have mothers or didn't have the culture to support them to do certain things. And in her charm center, she also had beautification classes, how to make makeup, hair, clothing, so that young women could actually know what professional wear looks like and how to carry themselves, even to the idea of what kinds of color for lips and what color for hair and uh, foundation garment, garnements, as my friend calls them, in regards to make sure your, your posture and your figure look appropriate. So she was very much concerned about the respectability of African-American women and girls in certain spaces because they would just dismiss you if you didn't look a certain way or dismiss you if you didn't carry yourself a certain way. So that was one of her local activities. And then another one that she did was the Baltimore Fuel Fund because she was responsible for her ward. And during 1978, the blizzard of 78, the entire East Coast was under, literally under feats of snow. And so as a result, she, people died in Baltimore City because they, they had their gas turned off. Their utilities were turned off for small amounts of money they owed. And several persons died. So that really bothered her that this gas company would turn off people's utilities. So what she sought to do was create a public-private partnership to be able to help people ameliorate their debt. And so that Baltimore Fuel Fund becomes the Victory and Q Adams Fuel Fund, and it gets picked up by other cities and states around the country. So that was another huge humanitarian effort of hers to kind of have the government look at how to really deal with their population and address those needs. So those are two that I can think of. And she also, she and her husband also founded the uh, William L. and Victory and Q Adams Foundation. And that was to help uh, uh, business students. Uh, can you say a little bit about that? 
Yes, her husband was a different kind of learner. I guess, I don't know what you would call him because he could not learn in a Socratic fashion, but he was brilliant. He had a photographic memory and numbers were his thing. He really could kind of understand numbers and crunch numbers and he was very good in that sense. So he loved education. He did not have the luxury to go to college or have the ability to go as high in education as she did. He really admired her for her degrees of education. So his idea was that he supported education. So if anybody wanted to go to school, he created a scholarship where they would pay literally for the four years of someone's education. And there is a documentary that I shared with the branch about this, that people who had still gone on that scholarship were appreciative up until the 90s, where they would pay a full ride for someone to go to school. And then also in the book, there's a conversation about him addressing the um, Clark Atlanta University class of like 1970 something, where he tells the students, you know, I might not have your degree, but there are certain things about just business and life that you need to know to add to your education. So the idea of doing better and making it better for those coming was what he really sought to do. So they were race men and race women. And so education was extremely important to that idea of knowing how once it's in your head, they can't take it away. And you know, a lot of them were numbers runners. My pastor said a numbers runner sent him to Howard University. Yeah, Mrs. Bethune also kept company with them. And, and I guess he saw it as innocuous, but when it became into prostitution and other kinds of illicit activity, he was out of the game by then. He didn't believe in abusing black people. Everybody made money off of their nickels, dimes and pennies. And even my uncle was into it. He said as a child, they told him to take this across the street. So he was just carrying the people across the street, bringing it back. <laughs> and my grandfather's like, don't you do that again. Don't, don't, don't you do that. So I get the whole community. He got a little, he got a penny for that. You know, carry this across and give me a penny. So he was at this in the 30s. So I'll do whatever you say you know so he didn't realize he was being kind of brought into the business so yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was very popular yeah there was a question from eric about um how did i learn about her and what happens is that in the archives as a fellow librarian you know those of us who have the information under our fingertips can't help but kind of become en enraptured with these things and she was very intentional, like I said, to have her materials deposited at Morgan. The collection had been there upon my arrival, but whatever was done was not done in archival standards that I like. So I had to reprocess the collection. And in reprocessing the collection and creating the Finding Eight, I was astounded because we share an organization in uh, like her and I are both are members of Sigma Gamma Rho sorority. And I said, how is she living during my time? I never heard of her. I've never heard of her. She's less than 50 miles away from me. How is this happening? So in learning about that, I said, there needs to be a book. That's always my inspiration. God tells me, you know, there needs to be a book. So from Kelly Miller to Victor Reed to all these other people. And that's what led me to kind of say, there needs to be some story about this. And then people who were living knew her. So it's not 18, you know, 96, it's 1966. So I thought that was very recent history that needed to be brought out. And the collection is so rich. Her and her husband even bought a beach. They owned a beach property and they had these kind of segregated beaches, the um, Eltonia. So they had their own resort space where they invited people to come out and do resorting. So they were a full press race conscious couple to create for African people in a Jim Crow world, a sense of civility, respectability and community. Now, now is the collection open to the public yet? And yes, it is. The Finding Aid is online. It is open to the uh, to the public. And it was interesting because within the first couple of months of it being up there, I was getting calls already to come and see things. So people were very excited to know that it was there. And the side note is that I was harvesting some things and found four other boxes that weren't were with the original collection. So there's some additional materials of hers, more of her legislative papers that were not in the collection that I had seen that need to be integrated in the process. So that's on the one of my burners, many burners that are going is to look at her legislative activity because there's letters from constituents in that second pool of material that were not with the original collection that will be processed in the coming future. Did the black men politicians support her? Oh, like, very uh, much so. Her husband definitely had, I think one lady said, he had a very large shadow over her. So people knew not to poke or mess with her. And it's interesting, she only had one bit of pushback, a man named Dr. Julian. And I, um, I forget his brother's name, he was a chemist. Oh goodness, but he was a medical doctor. And so when her husband wanted to open a McDonald's franchise in Mondawmin Mall, he pushed back against that. And he said, you know, we have obesity issues and health issues and to open a fast food joint is just to kind of proliferate these health issues. And she's just trying to get this licensure for her husband's business. So he did push back against her on that note. But he saw it as a business opportunity for black people to be able to work in a place and understand the work ethic and to be able to support each other in a workspace. So that was the one thing that I had found in just looking at how there was some pushback by a, a male politician against her effort to get the 
was it um, zoning or licensure for that McDonald's franchise that did not flourish at the Mondawmin Mall during the 1970s or something along those lines? So there was no, uh, I know for, for instance, Verda Freeman Welcome, that was an assassination attempt against her. But yeah. She never uh, experienced any of this kind of uh, backlash from folks. Yeah. So yeah, Linda White makes it, yes, Percy Julian was the brother to the Dr. Julian that I was dealing with in Baltimore City Council who pushed against or pushed back. But yeah, the assassination attempt with Verda Welcome was far more direct. She did not have the kind of male protection that Victorine had. There was a bombing in 1938. Her and her husband did experience being bombed. Uh, there was a house bomb. And that was during their kind of fledgling years because she was still a school teacher and he was kind of this uh, mid to low level numbers runner. And it's believed that and Mark, this guy named Mark Fax, I think his name is, he's in the book, talks about the idea that uh, Irish and Italian and Jewish white ethnics really wanted to run the black numbers business and mm -hmm. that they had bought out the cops. So it was believed that the Philadelphia crew had come down to Baltimore to kind of get Willie out of the business to take over the black numbers running so that that house bombing was not just random. It was very intentional. So he kind of befriends Russian Jewish people and kind of has this community relationship with them. So that kind of helps him kind of push back against the Italians, the Irish and others against trying to come into Baltimore to take over that game. And it's very interesting because it gets into mafioso kind of stuff, but I'm not trying to, to go into that part of the pond. <laughs> but um, it's interesting to see how that becomes business because mm -hmm. the Russian Jews and the European Jews do not get along in Baltimore City, from my understanding, historically, and that they have different intentionalities of how they identify culturally. So it's, it's very interesting to see those nuances, but that's not my area of understanding, but I know that that's, it does exist in a pool. Yeah. All right, I believe that uh, we have answered all of the questions in the Q&A. Um, let me see, Mr. Marvin Tupper Jones did have another question concerning, um, and perhaps you answered this, how Ms. Adams raised campaign funds and uh, who were or are her protégés who may be alive today? Yes, the campaign fund she raised on her own. She held various organizational activities at the Charm Center. She used that as her headquarters as well prior to the Mondaman Mall being secured. And even though her husband was worth millions, I mean, millions of dollars, his money did not harm her, but she did not use it as her primary source of income. So her teachers' organizations, the Red Cross, the sororities, her Catholic church affiliation, and other kinds of so alumni association from Morgan really facilitated her raising money for herself. Self. And that those kinds of dollars at that time took very little because she already had name recognition. Then her club woman, so the club woman also seed into her in terms of that. So she created her own sense of community and groundswell. Um, as regards to our protege, the, the defrocked um, Catherine Pugh, as well as Sheila Dixon, as like I said, Adrian Jones, these women who are sitting in current office or have had a current office, accredit her with having been the model for her and having literally engaged her in terms of starting their own careers in politics and public service. And as Barbara Mikulski as well was very clear on that and um, said that that's true, that she was very helpful in being able to model for her certain behavior. So they don't say it publicly, but there are those women from that area that say, yes, she did a lot for us. And we don't talk about it, but we thank her for it. So I'm trying to bring that to the surface to kind of see, like you say, this genealogy or this kind of protege chain of persons. And I do believe that is all of the questions that we have. We do have a comment in the chat from Ms. Roxana Malal saying, excellent presentation. Thank yes. you, Roxana. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so very much. And she did ask about the slides. I will share them with the branch. Um, and I know this is being recorded and possibly going to be on some social media platforms. So you're at liberty to do that as well. Uh, I definitely say if you can't buy the book, then ask your library for it. I'm all about public libraries and let's support them. So definitely ask your public libraries for the book. If not, there, there was a mini documentary that I sent out in the link to the association branch members as well. And it was called Visionary Leader. And there was a mini documentary that was done on her life that um, you could also look for in terms of her life to kind of look at a, a moving story of this in terms of that mini documentary. I want to thank you, Dr. Jones, for that wonderful, enlightening presentation. And uh, I want to ask you, um, 
what is the importance of other families and people thinking about archives and where to put their papers? You know, if these papers had not been placed in an archive, uh, this might not have been brought to your attention. Yeah, that's true. I think people need to think about that. And I know my mother was not such a person because I know, which is interesting because she kept my grandmother's things, but she was throwing hers away. Um, even uh, Dr. Benjamin Quarles, his wife, a second wife, heard him tearing things. He said, what are you ripping up? He said, I'm throwing this stuff away. So even uh, someone of that stature did not think that it was necessary to keep their things. So I think we have to create a sense of worth for ourselves. I know um, Dorothy Porter and definitely Lois Maylou Jones kept everything because she just knew she was great. And it takes, I guess, a level of that kind of arrogance to really see yourself as worthy and to see that you, someone will can learn from your story. And so I think we as African-American people and maybe African diasporic people, we do the oral tradition, but the documentary evidence, those photographs alone, even the rituals and induction ceremonies really are very instructive for us to kind of understand how they were thinking. So it's not just simply the oral tradition or the material culture, but I think it's a documentary evidence to actually see the handwriting, to actually kind of understand the interior mind or the interior life of an organization makes for a huge difference. So definitely we need to have these talk amongst ourselves even, because one student asked me, what are you doing about yourself? How are you documenting yourself? <laughs> and I'm like, ooh, never thought about that. Yeah. So it's, it's critical that we consider that as part of our ancestry and legacy. It definitely seems as though the, uh, this family uh, was multi-dimensional <laughs> in terms of her reach, uh, in terms of her husband's reach and uh, the things that they did and, um, and had an impact on. So thank you for sharing that story with us today. Um, I wanna remind everyone that next month we will be featuring uh, Marvin Jones and we invite you to Join us for that presentation if you're interested in hearing more about and learning more about what the Bethel Dukes branch of Asala is doing, please uh, uh, send us an email and we will include you in the discussion and, and alert you to any uh, additional programs that will be taking place and please uh, help us get the word out. Um, of course, we don't want people to miss out on these wonderful uh, informative presentations. So. Thank you for today's program. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jones, Dr. Janet Sims Woods, and uh, Demita Green for your helping to make this program possible. And we will see you again next month. Uh, the next meeting will be, presentation will be November, the Sunday, November. You know, I believe it's the 20th. The 20th? I believe it's the 20th. It's the week before Thanksgiving. Yeah. Okay. November the 20th at 3.30. See you then. All right. Thank you again. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.